Hey everyone, uh, sorry for the total fake out on the countdown. I figured since y'all waited a little bit longer than we usually tend to start that you didn't need to sit through the whole countdown. So welcome to a live episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Leslie Richardson. And today we are going to be talking all about MS Build. And joining me today is Microsoft MVP, Kevin Bost. Hey, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having How are you me, doing? Leslie. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah. So before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing on your day to day? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Kevin Bost, as Leslie said, a Microsoft MVP. Uh, I spend a lot of time online doing open source work. Uh, people will potentially recognize me from Twitch or YouTube. I do a lot of C Sharp and WPF. I'm the maintainer of the Material Design and XAML project, also the auto mocker library for mock, MOQ. Uh, and generally just enjoy being able to spend time online teaching people about everything related to .NET. Great. Yeah, so you're pretty prominent. Um, I, I was saying off live when we weren't live, kudos to anyone who does live coding <laughs> on stream, seriously. The amount of pressure <laughs> is high. Well, so like I said, the, the trick is just to be willing to look dumb in front of lots of people. That's yep. the minimum requirement. <laughs> I respect that. Cool. So what are we talking about today, Kevin? Yeah, so I'm going to take a look at MS Build. And oftentimes, this is one of the things that .NET developers, we are spoiled. We have amazing tools. Um, kudos to Microsoft for all of the, the effort that goes into those SDKs. But often what gets missed is being able to go through and configure it. Uh, a while back, we were given the project SDK format, which made uh, working with CS Proj files and honestly MS Build a, a lot easier and a, actually an enjoyable thing rather than kind of the cluttered mess that it may have been a little bit before that. And not to say it was horrible, but it definitely got significantly better. So today we're going to look at diving into doing it kind of from scratch with an effort of trying to learn the concepts um, and then hopefully draw parallels back to what exists in the .NET SDK today. because. The SDK is big and complex, and just opening that up and looking at it is a little overwhelming. So we're gonna we're gonna dial it down to a smaller bite-sized piece. Awesome. Sounds good to me. So before we get into the mostly demo heavy part of our show, can you give us a brief synopsis as to what MS build is? Because I feel like MS and build are two words that get used a lot <laughs> just in the Microsoft development world, just so yeah. we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Well, and it, it doesn't help that there's the Microsoft Build Conference. This is not related to that in any way, shape, or form. What? Darn. <laughs> yeah, it's very similar. We, we have to have term reuse, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So yeah. uh, MS Build is the um, underpinnings to the uh, project format. It is used as a way of uh, building up a set of dependencies and actions that are going to be executed. So when you run .NET build on the command line, you end up having multiple steps that often end up occurring. It's not just as simple as grab my C-sharp files, send them into the compiler. There's oftentimes things like resource strings that get built up, depending on your framework, Blazor, Wasm, uh, XAML. There might be extra steps that get involved there. Uh, MS build is what's actually driving that. Previously, people would invoke it with MS build exe on the command line. But now with Crossplat and the .NET SDK, most people are going to interact with it indirectly by going through the, the .NET SDK and either doing the helper commands like .NET build or even .NET MS build to kind of find their way into the, the needed commands. Awesome. Cool. So before we get started to the chat, thanks y'all. Thanks y'all for watching first up. And second, if you have any questions about anything that we're talking about related to MS build, don't be afraid to post them in chat and we will do our best to answer them. So please, please. Kevin, you ready? I am. As anyone who's seen my streams before knows, I very much love questions. So jump in whenever, always happy to, to detour and answer questions as long as it's relatively related to the topic. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Let's do it. Perfect. Let's dive in. Okay. So there is a repository, and I think we have the link that we can share out. And that's primarily what we're going to be going through looking at this. Um, there's a big, long readme, and I am not going to spend time uh, reading through it. But I am going to call out a couple uh, key highlights, specifically this additional resources down near the bottom. 
Um, there's various docs, repository references, and then down in these tools, the MS Build Binary and Structured Log Viewer. If you are doing any amount of work related to your build process or uh, diagnosing it, this tool is invaluable. Um, it is uh, an absolute godsend to be able to go through and see exactly what is happening. Um, think of it as your debugger for MS Build. So if you get nothing else, this is a tool that uh, I highly, highly recommend using, and we're going to be diving in and taking uh, a look at it quite a bit. Uh, one other thing, uh, in an effort to try to keep things simple, uh, we are scratching everything related to .NET. We are going to have our own code files, which uh, I have dubbed coder files, which as you can see, they are, they are very simple. They are just lines. Uh, and taking the place of our compiler today is going to be this coder string concat, or CSC for short. Uh, people familiar with the, the underpinnings of the C-sharp compiler will hopefully see the subtle joke there with the CSC EXE from there. Um, our compiler is as, I think, stupid simple as I could possibly make it. It literally is just going to concatenate some strings together. So nothing fancy here. But again, the idea is to treat this as though it were the compiler um, so that there is something there. Oh, and apparently my Outlook has just decided to restart and launch my calendar. Wonderful. <laughs> A day in the life. Observe. Uh, yes. <laughs> Go wrong with the demos. At least I've got the one thing. Right. Uh, Benjamin, there is a link to the repository. Um, I don't know. I drop it in the chat. I don't know. Let's see. I will drop it in the chat in just a sec, but here it is on the beautiful banner real quick. Perfect. Uh, there is. Oh. Um, interesting. Apparently, when I post comments in the chat, it, I get an error saying it failed to pa to post. So that's oh, weird. Exciting. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. I was I was worried it would be easy. Uh, yeah, we weren't sure what would happen when a guest posts on. We 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 record all this in Streamyard, and I was like, I don't actually know what happens if you were to try to comment, Kevin. And apparently, you get a fun error, yeah, which doesn't yeah, feel very I, user friendly, and that should be fixed. So, Streamyard, if you're watching, hint, hint. yeah, that would <laughs> that would be great. Um, so the other two things that are kind of hidden up here, there is a simple little CLI program that just goes through and invokes that same uh, compile async that we just saw. This is using the system command line library. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. Um, and then there's also a custom MS build task, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. So let's dive in and take a look at uh, demo one. So we kind of already saw the, the structure of this coder file. And then for the most part, everything is going to exist inside of this project file. All of these demos do have a little readme. Uh, for anybody who wants to go back and kind of review with some points of interest and kind of highlights of things to look at. And then because, change language mode, auto detect. Uh, because I have very intentionally named my thing with uh, my proj as the extension, VS Code isn't real happy with automatically detecting the language, but it, it figures it out. Um, but because it ends in proj, um, there is a lot of convention that exists inside of MS build and things that end in proj are one of the things that it knows. Ah, that is, that is a file for me to pick up and go and look at. Now, oftentimes when people dive into MS build, they'll start talking about the various components that, that make it up. And the, the big ones here are properties, items, tasks, and targets. Don't panic. If you don't remember the list, there's not a quiz later. Um, in, in our case here, uh, our properties are just going to be a couple of very simple things. The first is a uh, relative path to CSC. And you'll know this path is relative to the example my proj. So it's relative to the, the file that we're actually going to execute on. So it backs up a directory and dives all the way into my uh, bin release publish directory. There is a build script at the root of the repository. So if you clone this thing fresh, run the script, it'll get everything built and into a happy state for you. Um, and then we start diving into item groups. And the, the subtle difference between a property is sort of how you might expect uh, in C Sharp or .NET. A property just contains a single value, whereas an item group is a set of items. So rather than just assigning a single value to one of these, 
we might actually go through and use one of the globbing patterns to say, okay, I'm going to kind of slurp up everything. So in this case, it says, okay, let's find all of our coder files that exist in here. But, you know, there's a particular one that we're going to exclude. And kind of drawing some parallels to what you might see inside of the .NET SDK, this is why when you do .NET new with a new library project, why it automatically will pick up all of your C-sharp files as long as they're underneath your project directory, is it's hunting for well-known extensions and files and says, oh, okay, because I know that this is the SDK that you're doing, I'm going to do something similar. Now, obviously, they don't use coders. They use the compile type. And so inside of like Visual Studio, if you look at the properties, you might see that the type of object being there. And there's a lot of well-known ones for the .NET SDK. I have intentionally picked one that is not going to overlap because just trying to demonstrate the, the differences between those things there. Cool. How, um, how advanced can you get with those specifications? Can you go full reg, uh, regex on these item groups in terms of what kinds of files and things make their way into this? You you can get somewhat advanced. The 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 includes with the matching patterns are going to be somewhat uh, limited to the um, the matching pattern in here. It's not full on regex, but you can certainly drop into .NET related stuff to make modifications. So, for example, you can see up here we're actually leveraging the system.io.path class to be able to go through and pull stuff in. So you, you can start to invoke .NET. The number of functions that's available to you is not the breadth of the BCL, though. Um, there is sort of a hand curated list of, hey, here are the acceptable functions. But we'll take a look a little later about, hey, if I just want to run some C Sharp, how do I do that? Because occasionally you'll want to do something custom that's beyond the scope of what's here. And it gives you those uh, backdoors, hooks, or language of choice to be able to do it. Cool. Um, great question. I enjoy those. Uh, the the other thing, or I should say, the the next bit of it with MS Build is all about the tasks. These are the things that actually do the work. Um, and so, just ignore line sixteen with target here, and we'll focus on message. With MS, a bunch of built-in tasks that are available to you. Uh, one of which is message, which is just console out. I want to write it. And in this case, we've got our important set to high, which just says, please write this out all the time. I really, really want to see this because for whatever reason, starting build in my case is going to be critical for me to know about. Um, and then a target then is a, uh, a grouping of tasks of being able to go through and execute them. And in this case, you can see we have a build target. And down here, we are using the call target task to invoke yet another target. This is functionally equivalent to like what you might get with go to in C Sharp, where it's, I really just want to jump here. Now, just like in, in C Sharp, go to isn't always the right tool for the job. There's usually better options and same with MS Build, but we will get into those in uh, a later demo to take a look. And then finally, we get down to our uh, compile coders target. And this is the one that's actually going to be doing the work. And this is where we start to see some of the, the intricacies and how cool MS Build can be. Because if we just look at what is, and I'm going to collapse some comments just to get everything on the screen nicely. Uh, if we can see inside this target, this target has three tasks that it uh, has inside of it. It's going to read some lines from a file. Not surprisingly, it reads lines out of a file. Uh, it's going to output a message just showing us where the CSC path is, which in our case, just helpful debugging in case we try to find it. And then it's going to invoke csc.exe and pass a whole string of parameters in. And so you can see that we're building up something that looks like a command line invocation here. We'll look a little closer into that uh, as well. The interesting part here is the number of tasks that are going to be executed isn't three even though that may look like what is going on here. And the key idea is with this little percent thing, with the idea of batching. Because MS Build's building blocks are around properties and items, a lot of the things that you find sort of start to involve things like set theory, which is great. We can go through and do awesome things with sets. And that means that it's very common to say, hey, you know what? I want to iterate through all of the, the coders that I picked up because you'll recall up here, we just had one coder line that kind of globbed a bunch of things. 
which means the set of items inside of coders, in our case, is going to have two items. It's going to pick up teams one, two, and three, and then it's going to drop team three out of the list because we've decided that for whatever reason, we want to exclude that one. Nothing, nothing wrong with team three. They just get excluded for this demo. So down here, when we start doing batching, what this lets us do is say, okay, I want to iterate through all of the items in my coders collection, and I want to read the lines from those. And so this will actually end up executing multiple times, reading those lines out into a new item group called items from file. And it just knows to do that, knows, like knows to loop? It, because of the percent, it knows to go um, through and be able to do that batching and looping. And there's a there's a lot of this kind of intricate syntax. And in these comments here, I linked out to the docs for if people want to learn more about leveraging it. Um, because it is, at times, difficult to read MS Build and understand what's going on. Because... <laughs> the the simple the simple one character switch and now i've got something very different right. occurring um it's like i don't think percent equals for loop but yeah correct yeah, yeah. It, it gets into those kind of weird situations where it, it's really powerful but sometimes not always intuitive mm -hmm. um and then the other one that we get down here is this fun little at symbol down here because if we were to once again use batching on exe down here it would end up iterating through each of our items in the coders collection and calling our compiler once for each of those. And that's not what we want here because we saw that our compiler, all it does is take in those strings, concatenate to them together and write out to the file. So if we were to batch, we'd end up with just whatever the last item was written to the file, which is not ideal, right? The whole point is we're trying to concatenate things together. And so in this case, what it does is it actually says, okay, I want to transform the items in this collection. And in this case, this is uh, effectively a string interpolation, string format, depends on how people want to look at it, where it's going to go through the, the items in file, which, we, which are the individual lines. So in this case, it'll be Kevin, Adam, Tiffany, Kelly, Heather, Josh, et cetera. And for each of those, it's going to create this command line option. And then it's going to separate them with a space. If you don't do uh, the extra parameter here, uh, MS Build likes to put semicolons when it's delimiting items. And then finally, on the end of the command line, it's going to do this output to an output file. And so that will end up invoking our command line execution. So let's actually let's actually show this working. So if we go here and jump into demo one, and then we will go ahead and run .NET build. See, this is the problem with Copilot, is it's skipping ahead in my demos and trying to spoil the ending. <laughs> Copilot what really is doing? the kid in the back of the class that likes to show off. <laughs> right. They they raise their hand, but they don't actually wait for the person to call on them and we'll just blur it out anyway. <laughs> Correct. I, I really need to learn to turn it off before demos because it spoils the ending. It's like, ah. <laughs> I've had to do that too for <laughs> some reason demos I've done. I'm like, not you, Copilot. <laughs> Like I'm trying to build to that. Stop getting yeah, that. like tension. It's a it's a thing. It makes things more satisfying. <laughs> yeah. So we can see we when we run .NET build uh, because uh, the uh, .NET SDK wants to look for a target named build when you run .NET build. It's a one of the well known conventions. Uh, we see our starting build message, which is great. That's what we expected to see. We then called our target. We can see then we saw our second message where it then output the entire path for us. And you can see it's now um, fully qualified the path because of our get full path call up here. Great. We can see the resolution of that. And then it did some amount of work. And we know that our output file was concat.txt. So if we take a look at it, there we have successfully uh, potentially done one of the hardest ways to concatenate several strings together. <laughs> I'm sure we could make it more complicated if we wanted to, but this might, uh, again, emphasis on that. But let's take a little bit, yeah, let's take a little bit closer look at what's happening. So if you tack on the, the BL switch, this is for binary log. And if we run this, you'll note that there's a new file that has shown up, this MS build bin log. So going back to that uh, binary log viewer that I, I mentioned earlier, if we go ahead and fire this up, 
and I apologize. This thing does not zoom in, but I can zoom in. So this is a very valuable tool to be able to go through and actually see what is happening with uh, MS Build. And the key things here is MS Build does everything in two passes. There's the evaluation pass where it goes through, evaluates all of the files, figures out what it's going to do, and then there's the actual execution pass. And so we can see the evaluation here and then the actual execution down here. The other thing I will point out is that we'll see that it actually executes twice and it also evals twice as well. The reason is because the .NET SDK, when you run .NET build, by default, it wants to run a .NET restore as well because in a normal SDK situation, you want to restore all your dependencies and then go ahead and compile it. Now, we can go through and turn that off if we go back here, the dash dash no restore. And then if we go through and fire up our MS bin log, and if we look, we can see that rather than having two executions, we're now down to just a single one. So if you are debugging your MS build process, just be aware that there are things that the .NET SDK is going to do to be helpful for you. And it's sometimes important to know what is happening so that you can actually understand the output from this tool. Uh, uh, oh, and then Benjamin calls out that if you run .NET build and .NET publish on the uh, coder string concat project, uh, it seems to be required before .NET build on uh, demo one. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me, uh, I, I hope I had called it out in here. There is, if you run this uh, build PS1 at the root of the repository, you will note that it actually will go through and try to do that compilation to get you into a working state as well, Benjamin. So if that's helpful, there is a build PS1. I will double check my readme to make sure that that's actually well documented because when I wrote the readme, it may have been at a time when I did not have enough caffeine in the system. And it's Fair. very possible I may have, <laughs> I may have missed some things. Okay, let's jump back to, to this terminal here. Um, I did want to call out uh, just a couple things to show inside of the evaluation. And don't worry, I will zoom this in in just a moment. Um, so underneath the evaluation, we can see the, the properties. And we can see that our CSC path gets populated here, especially when you're going through and debugging issues with MS Build. Being able to look at the um, evaluation of your properties is invaluable, especially if you start getting cases where uh, maybe you've brought in a NuGet package that tries to, to augment the SDK and then there's a conflicting one. You can start to see where properties get overwritten just by searching for them and saying, okay, where is this property being set to? The other really nice part is um, when you come into the items, you can also see the the items that got picked up in the evaluation. And you'll note here, we don't necessarily see the addition of team three and then the subtraction of team three. All we see is the resulting uh, team one and team two that came through at the end of the evaluation phase. And then finally, down here, if we go and look, we can see that underneath our project, we can see that those are the targets that got invoked. We see build and then compile coders. And then the best thing ever, if you double click on the targets, it will actually jump you right into the relevant uh, file where that came from. And this awesome. is true of the SDK as well as my custom one, is it will just straight show it to you and you can start to see and walk your way through the various parts. Now the .NET SDK, you're not going to see just two targets here. You're going to see a list that doesn't fit on here without a scroll bar because there's been a little bit of work done there, um, and those engineers have been quite busy trying to make sure that they've covered every possible case that could occur. So just be aware that that is a, um, a, a thing available. That is great, and I, I love how involved that log viewer is. Like It can look a bit overwhelming initially, but mm -hmm. clearly it's providing a lot of it, it provides a lot of value. And, and I will point out, there's there's a lot of documentation over here as well um, oh, to be able to go through and do it. I really like how it 
tries to call out the various syntax that you can use to try to start doing searches for it. There's a lot of information there as well. But then just being able to straight search right up in the log to say, here's the thing that I'm looking for. Because quite often when you're running into problems with your build process, usually there's a useful error message that tells you something. Now, sometimes that error message is specific to a task or a target that's being run. And so being able to search in and go, wait, how did I even get here in the first place? And you can right. start to try to figure out what, why am I even here? What, <laughs> what sort of things went wrong for me to re reach this point? Yep. So it, it's not a full IDE debugger, but the it, it exposes all of the information of what steps MS Build went through in its process um, and really provides that clarity and explanation for what's going on there. Okay, I want to dive through in and take a look at uh, example project two and then uh, change language mode auto because it needs to go through and do it. So this is going to be fairly similar to the last one. So I'm just going to kind of call out some of the highlights of the, the stages that it's gone through to be able to look at this. So the, the key thing here, and we saw it before with the comment about the just the go-to behavior of invoking targets is generally not the behavior you want. Part of the evaluation path pass that MS Build does is figuring out the dependencies between these targets. And so primarily what you'll want to end up doing is actually setting before targets or after targets to be able to control when things get executed. Because quite often you don't care about executing a target at an exact point but you do care about making sure that you run either before something or after something's already done. This is actually how the uh, before build and after build targets exist inside of your CS Proj. Most of us remember getting to there by going to the project properties in Visual Studio and typing into the box and then looking at, oh, this is what it generated inside of my CS Proj. Oh, that's how it works. But all it is is a well-named target that is set up to know that, hey, I run before build runs before the build target, after build runs after the build target. And so it gives you a point to say, okay, I know that I'm going to run at some point in here and MS build can figure out that dependency tree and then know which ones to be able to go through and execute. The other one that I will call out is this initial targets, this init, especially with the idea of uh, wanting to always have something that goes first to make sure it gets initialized. This is one of the ways to be able to go through and control it. Now, I set default targets build as well. This is not as critical if you're invoking MS build from uh, by going through .NET build because .NET build wants to look for that build target already and wants to specify it. The thing that you can do as well is if there is a particular target that you are interested in invoking directly, uh, let's see. No, Copilot, demo two, not three. Quit getting ahead of the game. <laughs> Add Copilot. Um, is you can actually, on the .NET build, you can just do dash T for target, and then you can specifically say, hey, I would like to run uh, before build. And so it will very intentionally go through and in and say, okay, rather than the target being the, the build target as the default one, we're going to execute before build. Well, I know that in order to run before build, I have to actually do the init target. And so it goes, okay, now I go through and run that as well. And so we can start to see the output of, okay, we got one initialized from our restore call that .NET build likes to run because I left off the dash dash no restore. And then we get one initialized for actually running the build. And then we can see that it ran just the before build target. We didn't get any of our other outputs. The other big thing that uh, MS Build provides us in here, and the big change here, is this idea of inputs and outputs. And this is one of the most powerful things that it has that is just absolutely amazing. This is what enables the incremental build process. So quite often when you run .NET Build, so if we go uh, .NET Build and just we'll just let it go, we can see that it went through it did its initialization before build, building, after build, and it did all of the work. And let's get you out of the way because you're just you're just interfering. <laughs> okay. And if I run it a second time, you'll note here I don't see the output from this build target. And the reason we don't see the output from the build target is because it's keeping track of the inputs and outputs, and it knows that neither of these have changed. 
because we've told it, hey, the inputs for this target are the coders, until the coders change, our, if unless something happens to our output file, we're fine. Just use the previous output file. Cool. Does so, it do that behavior by default? Or is that something that you have to tell it to do to just basically like, don't um, display this info unless it's actually changed? That action. Cool. Well, so by specifying the inputs and outputs, you'll get that behavior by default. So you have to tell it about the inputs and outputs. Like the before build, because it doesn't have any inputs or outputs because it's just outputting a message, it's always executing because it doesn't know that it's allowed to check it. So when specifying the inputs and outputs, and actually we can go through and do the binary log and then fire this guy up. And what we can see when we jump into here is if we come down here, we can see that we skip the build target because all output files are up to date with the respected input files. Now, this is not an advanced check. This is last updated file timestamp thing. But if we come in here and we say, okay, you know what? Uh, let's go and put in Kevin too, because reasons. Uh, if we run again, we'll now actually see that the build executed because it knows, ah, okay, something has changed about my inputs. I now know that there is something new there. So I now need to update my output file and we can double check our output file to see that, yes, in fact, we did go through and add in Kevin2 into the list. And if we once again build, we'll see that it knows, okay, the last time I updated, everything's fine. I don't need to run that again. And this is how you start to see a lot of those speed ups come because some tasks in MS Build, like when you do a fresh clone, everything's clean, rebuild, it has to run all the things. But once it has stuff locally, and it knows that, okay, until this changes, I don't need to worry about rebuilding this. There's a lot of optimizations that come that can come from just reusing your same output file, which is, the, this is one of the most absolutely amazing things. So if you're doing any sort of custom MS build stuff where you are generating outputs, pay special attention to be able to leverage this. Um, I've used it quite a few times for like resource generation or similar where I'm, in ingesting red uh, resx files and outputting something else making sure that it knows hey you only really need to run this if you know one of the resx files changes great that is an awesome use of this because now we can go through and control how often things actually need to run the other thing that is subtly slipped in here is this clean target at the end once again dot net if we tried to do this on the um, demo one you'd end up getting an an, an error but uh, .NET also has a clean target. And so if you specify a target named clean, it knows to go through and, in our case, run this target, which we can see down here. We did the initialize, and then inside of clean, it removed our bin directory. Great. And now if we rerun build, we'll see that it knows that it has to go through and build it up. Even though the coders file hasn't changed, it's still looking to compare the timestamps of the of when it knows the inputs were processed and the output file. And so because the output file is different, in this case missing, it knows that it has to go through and rerun the build and recompile it back out. Which I, I think that is just an absolutely amazing feature. Yeah, that is pretty impressive. Um... <laughs> Especially yeah. when you, you can focus on just what are the inputs, what are my outputs? Mm -hmm. You don't have to deal with all of the the extra logic that goes into to making that work. And again, it's fairly simple with just a timestamp check, but it's it's still very powerful. Yeah. Okay. That, that's great. Just getting all those kind of built-in status updates. As, as exactly. Long as you're some outputs. Okay, we're going to take a look at demo three, and demo three is going to be very exciting because our project file changes to basically nothing and this is this is where we start to see it, it for people who are absolutely amazed when we got the new project format for .NET and our project files went from you know hundreds of lines of files to like four this is how it was done <laughs> um, this is the magic that made it work Pulling back uh, and, to yeah the and this is also why you see people referring to it as the project SDK format because this little SDK right here at the beginning that's where this comes from. So rather than just leveraging the the built-in SDKs, it is actually possible to produce your own MS Build SDKs if you want to and distribute them via NuGet. 
there are a handful of ones that already exist out there. Um, and the specific one here, the uh, MS Build SDKs. So this is kind of a, a testing ground. You'll note that there's one out there that was for like centralized package management that has now made its way into actually MS Build proper all the way through. But there's a lot of useful uh, auxiliary SDKs that you can pull in there as well. Uh, oh, quick let's question see. in chat yep. before you keep going. Uh, is there ever a time that check can give errors because it's only a time check? And is that something a dev would ever have to worry about? Um, and then going back to there are there are certainly times you where you can run into situations where the the inputs and outputs don't accurately reflect the state of when things have changed. It's usually um, something has changed and MS Build doesn't realize it needs to rerun versus the opposite. Um, with various things changing, you run into this a lot. Uh, like .NET Maui um, is constantly fighting with this because there's so many different things that they have to try to keep track of to make all of the native stuff work. Um, and so it's it's not uncommon. Like maybe you create a PNG that is expected to be picked up as a resource and embedded somewhere, but because you know PNG wasn't part of the set of inputs, that target didn't run. So uh, oftentimes, especially in Visual Studio, if you find that you have to do like a, a rebuild, which is functionally .NET clean, .NET build, oftentimes what that is doing is just intentionally wiping the outputs to force that, that target to rerun. Um, so there are certainly times you can get errors because it's only a time check, but oftentimes the developer experience is the times where people fall into, hey, just run a rebuild on the project or, uh, you know, clean and rebuild type situation. So it does occur oftentimes when the SDK is written well, it doesn't occur much, but it, it certainly can come up. I know I get bit mostly with my own targets because I am not nearly as diligent about covering all the cases as the .NET SDK team is. So that can sometimes be a problem. And usually the solution is just clean and rebuild. Yeah, so is it something you have to be worried about? If you're if you're authoring your own, it's definitely something you should be trying to think through and handle as much as possible. But with the understanding that oftentimes a simple clean will get you back out of that situation. Cool. Great question. Thank you, Thank you Benjamin. Um, so the one thing that did get left inside of this project is our removing of the the Team Three coder, um, just in an effort to try to simulate what might actually be in a real SDK. Uh, removing a hard-coded uh, file is typically something that would be done at the project level, not at the SDK level. The SDK is going to be slurping up all of the stuff. So then the question is, where did this magical thing come from? So if we go and look, there is a NuGet folder sitting alongside at the root, and there is also a NuGet config. I'm just going to point out that the NuGet config at this root is using that NuGet folder as a package source. So that's one thing that's that's important to note is there is a, a local folder being used as a NuGet package source, which is how this is able to be done. If this was hosted up on NuGet.org, we wouldn't necessarily need that, but I don't really feel like posting custom SDK as a package. That seems pretty worthless. Um, I have already run my build PS1 script, so you will see that I do have custom SDK version 1.0 hanging out in here, which is what is being referenced right here. So this SDK is just being built up. So what exactly is inside of this SDK? Underneath um, the, the NuGet package, we have an SDK folder with a props and a target. Now you'll see props and target uh, files get referenced a lot with MS Build, specifically uh, around doing customization of, of your build process. The default SDK supports things like directory build.props, directory build.targets, and functionally, all these things are are two separate um, uh, MS build files that are going to get included. Props gets included early in the process. Targets it get included late. So if you though you can put items and property groups and and targets in either of them, just understand that that's the order of operations. Is props is expected to be at the beginning. Targets is expected to be at the end. Uh, in the readme, there's a link out here to um, the 
uh, do, 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 I believe it's this one up here that shows the MS Build SDKs repository, and they've got a nice write up showing the the separation of where those files actually get brought in to the process. But you could imagine including a props file at the beginning here and the targets file at the end here, and that would get us roughly the same thing. But because of what has been set up with our NuGet integration, we get all of that for free. Um, the only other thing you can see here is we did add a condition to our logging verbosity. And conditions are probably the attribute that most people are familiar with with MS Build. Oftentimes being able to do conditional things inside of their CS projects, often on like configuration. I'll see people leverage this for, hey, I'm going to set these set of properties only on the debug configuration, for example. Condition is a, kind of a meta level uh, attribute. You can specify it on individual items. You can specify it on groups, item groups, targets, and you can get as complex as you would like with each of these. And then down in our targets, there's also been a, a small amount of cleanup down here. I'll circle back up to this using targets. I'm going to collapse the ones that are matching from before. But you'll note that our build target is now a little bit different. We still have our inputs and outputs, but we are no longer actually reading in those files ourselves anymore. Instead, we've now got our own CSC task that takes in the set of coders and then an output file. And you'll note there's a subtle difference in syntax. The at symbol is indicating an items collection, whereas the dollar sign is indicating a property. And if we take a quick look at our build task, I'm not going to dive too deep into authoring MS build task. There's links in the readme for those people who want to dive into it. But we can see this brings in the coder files and the output file. And all this task is going to do is read all of the text out of those files and then invoke that same compilation for us. This is one of those escape hatches where if you really want to do something custom, you can always author your own task and then sky's the limit have at it. You've got your own execute method inside of C sharp. You can do what you need to do. Uh, you do have to target net standard 2.0 if you want to have reasonable support between .NET CLI and Visual Studio. That's just one of the uh, idiosyncrasies of having to work cross-plat. Uh, if you've got a more targeted uh, user base, you might be able to get away with something different, but generally your uh, targets are going to be net standard 2.0. And then if we come down here and Copilot doesn't spoil the demo, good. So if we go ahead and run .NET build, then hopefully everything just works. So we can see we did in fact compile and get all of the output as we expected. We can see our uh, output that we have here is fairly clean. Because we have that logging verbosity, you can go through and set the, the properties straight on the command line, because you'll note if, if nothing's set, it defaults to normal. But we can come in here and say, okay, what if we change this into high? And then now we can actually see the before and after build. And if we were to run a clean or similar, we would then be able to see the, the incremental build process work just as it did before. So functionally, this is how your underlying SDK is functioning. It's nothing more than these building blocks, but a lot more of it. So I want to stop there and see if we've got any more questions. But at least in terms of these demos, is there anything more that you want me to dive into, Leslie? Um, no, I mean, I think that's great. If we had more time, I mean, it sounds like we could do a whole other episode on tasks in and of itself because I, I was kind of starting to get curious about that. I'm like, yeah, you can do yeah. a lot in just uh, the main SDK project. Uh, CS Prosh files, but like, what if you wanted to extract some of that? Yeah. So, that's and really I will cool. say too, there there is the um, I linked out to some of the docs. You can do inline C sharp inside of MS Build as well. So if you don't want to go to the effort of actually like having a project with a C sharp file, and you really just want to do inline C sharp, because the best place to write C sharp is inside of an XML file which can oftentimes be, be, be a little bit fraught with peril, but sometimes you just want to drop into to C Sharp to do something simple-ish, right? Judgment call of as far as whether you should actually author your own task. And there are times where sometimes that quick and dirty solution does work quite well. So it does allow uh, inline tasks to be authored straight there. The syntax is a little weird. You have to specify parameters in kind of a funky way, but it it works and and goes through and does it 
The other thing I'll mention too is the execute method when you're writing your task is synchronous. So this can be sometimes a little bit problematic when you want to start doing asynchronous coding. You'll note here I, I cheated with a task run with a dot wait on the end, which is generally a, a, a no-no, but the, the API of MS Build really requires everything to be invoked uh, in a synchronous fashion. And so if you want to start leveraging async APIs, just be aware that you're probably going to end up doing something similar to this. And there's various base classes to, to derive from. The, the implementation that you actually need is iTask, but there is this kind of helper one that gets you a little bit of um, usefulness in there. Cool. Um, can you do all of this in Visual Studio since we've been doing in doing all this in VS Code, or is this more? Oh yes, absolutely. The, the only reason I was in VS Code is the the folder view is a little bit nicer. Um, this this solution here fires up and runs. Um, Visual Studio is not going to be as hip to loading up my proj files because those aren't the things that it knows about. It wants to leverage like CS proj or, or similar. So the the solution view that um, people are familiar with, you're, you're not going to have like the language support or similar. So Visual Studio Code is somewhat helpful because it has a little bit better, uh, or I should say looser rules around the languages it's going to, to let you play with. But for example, this uh, coder string concat, this solution file certainly fires up and um, in Visual Studio and lets, uh, lets you dive through that. Um, I do see a, a quick comment in the chat. What does asynchronous coding mean? So uh, with C-sharp, asynchronous coding uh, oftentimes will get used with the async and await keywords, which is what was kind of uh, buried inside of there. So these two here, there's a lot of great documentation. That is easily an hour in and of itself. Um, so uh, if you're interested, I will say there I've got some videos on it on my YouTube channel or the uh, docs on uh, docs.microsoft.com are excellent for a lot of these C-sharp concepts and they are littered with examples in there, especially around best practices, because that's an area that is a, a, a deep complex rabbit hole when you start yeah. getting into the specifics. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've done like a full episode at least once on this show about <laughs> asynchronous. Excellent. I'll, asynchronous. I will throw that into the list of resources too. Past uh, episodes of Visual Studio Toolbox, also going to drop this um, semi-recent blog post that the .NET blog did on async versus await, or, or how async and await work, if you're curious. About that too, but yeah, <laughs> that's a whole can of worms is what we're yes. trying to say. <laughs> yes, I, I believe I, I went through and read that blog post, and it is, it is absolutely amazing. Uh, Let's see. And then there's a question there. Do you have do you have to pre-build the project where the task is implemented? And how do you add it to the project where you need to use it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I actually skimmed over that and did not show it well. So I appreciate that question. Um, inside of the targets file here. So I down at the usage, I did csc.task. In order to actually uh, leverage uh, custom tasks, you do have to actually include them. So in uh, in my case here, you'll see that there is a using task and I'm just gonna bring that down around for visibility. And so you can see the, the task name is going to be the fully qualified name of the type that is the task. So in my case, because it is buried underneath um, uh, coder string concat dot build CSC task, that makes my fully qualified name, namespace, type name. And then you do have to tell it where the DLL is that contains this. Now, in my particular case, part of what I have done is the, the NuGet package itself is bundling up the DLL as well as these MS build files. So inside of the new spec file down here, this file down here, so in addition to bringing in the two files underneath the SDK folder, it's actually also hunting out all of the assemblies underneath my uh, published directory for that build project, which is part of why running that uh, build PS1 script at the root uh, is important. So that will put all of these files inside of the build folder inside of my NuGet package. 
And there is a well-known uh, MS build property called uh, MS build this file directory. There's also like MS build this file if you just want to get access to the functionally the uh, this variable uh, type situation. But inside of the NuGet package itself, we go up a directory to get up outside of the SDK folder, down a directory into the build, which is what the new spec specified, and then all the way into the DLL itself awesome. to be able to Great go through question. and pull it up. And, and I think if I, oh, it's not going to let me, we can, I, I, this is this is where I go off script and go with something <laughs> I didn't test. We're going to demo gods. <laughs> um, Please work. There we are. Oh, it works. Yay. So NuGet Package Explorer, wonderful app, very much recommended. Once again, doesn't play nice to zoom in, but we can see here, this is the, the bundling of the items. And I can go through and if we look and see, there is the there is the output of, of how this is ending up working. So the targets file with the relative path up into the DLL file that contains the task with using task. Yeah. Uh, and Daniel Smith, I completely agree. The uh, We use it all the time and take it for granted since it works so well. Yes, absolutely. And huge points to the Microsoft engineers that build out all of the SDKs. It, just the sheer magnitude of the amount of this stuff that they have to go through and handle is kind of mind boggling. Um, the, the readme on this repo does link back to their GitHub repo if you really want to uh, dive into everything that's there. Because the nice part is this stuff is open source. And Woo! with MS Build, like we saw, you can double click and jump straight to the file. Like these SDKs are just targets and props files on your disk installed somewhere that have gotten referenced through various chains of, of things. And dealing with getting all of that stuff right is, I can only imagine a, a nightmare for somebody. <laughs> and I'm thankful <laughs> that somebody else has done it for me. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, it's great. Clearly, a lot of work has been put into this. And I mean, it being open source, eyes and on the cake. And yeah. yeah, clearly, a lot of people appreciate and find this interesting. Just seeing a lot of comments on thanks for showcasing MS build, because I, I think a lot of us do take it for granted. It's just sort of this thing in the background. But yeah, it just works. floats underneath and, and <laughs> yeah. disappears. So and thank you for having me on, Leslie. This was great. I, Like I said, I really enjoy being able to go through and, and show off this kind of stuff and kind of dive into how it works because I think understanding how it works opens that door for people to go through and build out the, the customizations that they need. I've seen people jump through all kinds of hoops to, to do stuff in their projects to get things lined up just right. It's like, it, you know, we can do this with MS Build and it's That's then all sweet. just bundled in and ready to go. Yeah, and you know, it's like, the word magic is such a controversial world in developer land. I, I personally like it, but I get that other people don't. And so it's always nice to be able to pull back that curtain and, and see how something is really working. So you can take it yeah, for your own needs. Absolutely. Uh, there was a request to link the oh. the MS build tool. And oh, that's not it. It's this one. So uh, msbuildlog.com. I would drop the link in the chat, if, except for I'm apparently banned from... Uh, <laughs> It's yes, they're not promoted, but so, it's directed toward them. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and it, it install. They've got they've got good install directions here for um, installing with your uh, platform tool of choice. Um, so, Winget, Chocolatey, Mac directions as well. If you are on a Mac, perfect. Cool. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing this. This was super informative. And if people want to learn more, reach out to you, where's the best place they can go? I'm assuming yeah. your website, which we have. Yeah. Posted. So if, if people want to find me, um, I don't know if you can drop that. Yeah. The link there at the bottom, uh, kaboo.dev has a link to all of my stuff. You can find me on YouTube, Twitter, um, discord, etc. There is all of my links there as well. If people are interested in uh, kind of C sharp.net coding, especially stuff around maybe XAML or WPF. I do a ton of that on my uh, Twitch and YouTube videos. and But I enjoy diving into anything .NET related as well. Awesome. All right. Well, Kevin, thanks again. Hopefully we'll have to bring you back. I mean, tasks, that's a whole 
can of worms oh, yeah. <laughs> that we could talk about soon. And thank you to all the viewers for tuning in up to this point. Go try out all of the things that you can do with MS Build that you probably didn't even realize it could do. And with that, happy coding, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Happy coding. <laughs>